Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Neeraj Shah, the director of the Maine CDC. I'm delighted to be joined this afternoon by Governor Janet Mills and Maine DHHS Commissioner Jean Lambrew. We're here to provide everyone an update on where we stand with respect to coronavirus here in the state of Maine for today, Wednesday, June 16th, 2021. I'll start by providing the epidemiological update and then turn things over to Governor Mills. I begin my portion of today's update on a sad and somber note. The Maine CDC is reporting five additional deaths among individuals with COVID-19 today. Two of them were residents of Aroostook County, two were residents of Cumberland County, and one a resident of York County. Three were women and two were men. One individual was in their 40s, another in their 50s, another in their 70s, and two in their 80s. Two of the additional reported deaths today were the result of a periodic review by Maine CDC of vital records, the death certificates of individuals. Two of the five deaths that we are reporting today were the product of that occasional process. And those two deaths occurred at the end of May. With these five additional deaths that we are reporting today, 853 individuals have passed away with COVID-19 since the beginning of the pandemic. We'd like to take a moment to offer our deepest condolences to the friends, family members, and communities of these five individuals and all 853 who have passed away. Overall across the state, there are now a total of 68,000 683 cases of COVID-19, representing an increase of 51 cases since yesterday. In terms of hospitalizations, 2,056 people have been hospitalized cumulatively. Right now in Maine, 32 people are in the hospital being treated for COVID-19. 17 of them are in the ICU and seven are on a ventilator. To put that number in perspective, two weeks ago, one incubation period ago, there were 87 people hospitalized with COVID-19 in Maine. 29 of them were in the critical care unit and 18 of them were on a ventilator. That means that in one incubation period, two weeks, the number of people hospitalized in Maine with COVID-19 has fallen 63%, just over a two week period. In terms of our testing metrics, our seven-day PCR positivity rate stands at 1.16%, and our, our, our seven-day antigen positivity rate stands at 3.46%. That's where we are from an epidemiological and public health perspective with COVID-19 right now. Governor Mills, I'd like to turn things over to you. Thank you, Dr. Shaw. <clears throat> Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for the update, Dr. Shaw. As always, um, the 4th of July holiday, Independence Day is right around the corner. Uh, it'll be a day, of course, of uh, dedicated to celebrating our precious freedoms. And after a long, difficult year that we've had, year plus, a day to celebrate freedom will be most welcome. As you know, <clears throat> President Biden called on the states to have delivered at least one shot, uh, one vaccine one vaccine dose to 70% of all adults in their states by this July 4th to celebrate our victory over this formidable enemy, just as the founders of our country celebrated our nation's victory in their battle, the battle for independence. In typical Maine fashion, we met President Biden's goal 53 days ahead of time and then we beat it for a larger population. We vaccinated 70% of not just people over 18 or 18 and older, but people age 12 and older. So today, more than 74% of Maine people age 12 and up have received at least one dose of COVID-19 vaccine. And we're closing in on having 70% of all Maine adults fully vaccinated. We rank third best among the states in the percentage of all our eligible residents who are fully vaccinated. Third best in the state. We kind of compete with Vermont, a little bit with Connecticut, going back and forth, one, two, three. But we're right up there. Every day we're right up there. 
Maine people are resilient, but we also rely on one another. Our nation leading progress in beating back this pandemic and getting our state back to normal is because of the more than 876,000 people in Maine who've already rolled up their sleeves and gotten vaccinated. We should celebrate this milestone, but let's not stop there. We won't be satisfied until everyone who's eligible has had a vaccination. Let's keep going. We know the best way to protect ourselves, our loved ones, our communities is to get vaccinated. That's why our numbers are coming down. Still people are in the hospital, still people on ICU, still people sadly dying with COVID-19. And we want to put a stop to it. So to encourage even more people to get their vaccine, today I'm announcing the Don't Miss Your Shot Vaccination Land Sweepstakes. One vaccinated person, one lucky person who's gotten at least one shot will win a dollar for every person vaccinated in Maine by the 4th of July. If the drawing were held today, the prize would total $876,655. But for every person vaccinated between now and 6 a.m. on July 4th, we'll add another dollar to the prize. This is all federal money, mind you, no state appropriations. The more Maine people who are vaccinated, even with one shot, the bigger the prize for some lucky winner. All residents, <clears throat> Maine residents age 12 and up, who've, who've received at least one dose of vaccine, Moderna or Pfizer, COVID-19, or the one dose Johnson & Johnson, since December, when we first started, December 15th of 2020, all people can enter for a chance to win the prize. It's a lot of money. It's gonna be gonna get bigger and bigger. Registration is a must, it's required, and the deadline to get vaccinated and to register will be 11.59 p.m. just before midnight on June 30, 2021, exactly two weeks from tonight. You don't have to be fully vaccinated by June 30 to qualify, but you do have to have gotten at least one dose. We hope that you'll be on your way to getting being fully vaccinated. To visit a vaccination site near you, visit the state's vaccination website maine.covid backslash covid19 backslash vaccines it's maine m-a-i-n-e spelled out dot gov backslash covid19 backslash vaccines or call the community vaccination line 1-888-445-4111 registrations for the sweepstakes are being accepted now online and you can visit maine.gov backslash covid19 backslash covid uh, vaccines for more information or call the community vaccination line again, 1-888-445-4111. We will randomly select a winner using a process that mirrors the main state lottery and we'll announce the winner on July 4th. So don't miss your shot. Vaccination land. By getting vaccinated, you could win nearly a million dollars, maybe more. With every person that gets vaccinated, a dollar more is added to the pot. You know, Maine people look out for each other every day without fanfare or fuss. And that has been especially true these last 15, 16 months. Despite risks to yourselves and to the, and the adversity of our time and through courage, compassion and perseverance, you have helped our state survive this pandemic and become known as one of the safest states in the nation. In the nation. You deserve a reward for rolling up your sleeve and for proving that Maine people will always have each other's backs. Don't miss your shot. Thank you. We'll be happy to take a few questions from members of the media. And I'm pleased again to be joined by Commissioner Lambrew, who's been working hard on this project and so many other aspects of public health these very difficult months preceding. Thank you. Thank you, Governor. Uh, the first question for the afternoon goes to Patrick Whittle from the AP. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I'd like to know if there's anything new on the on the on the sort of what school is going to look like in the fall front. Do we do we have any idea of um, like sort of if if Maine looks on September first the way it looks right now? What are uh, school uh, protocols going to look like? Uh, Governor, I'll begin by saying we did work with the Department of Education to release a bulletin recently 
<clears throat> that said the following is in light of the governor's uh, June 30th end of the state of civil emergency, in light of the progress that we made in vaccination as well as schools participating in a pooled COVID-19 testing program, that for the fall, we do expect that the physical distancing requirements will be repealed. There will be no longer the need for desks to be spaced three feet apart for kids to sit six feet apart in cafeterias, for example, which have been those factors that are that were limiting in-person learning. So I think it's safe to say, and Governor, you can speak to this, we do expect children in Maine schools pre-K through 12 this fall to be in classrooms five days a week. That is our expectation indeed. Um, all schools should be fully open. Uh, and um, we'll continue to vaccinate those 12 and up, those who are eligible for vaccinations, uh, and offer pool testing to schools, um, which, which might help them keep, keep kids safe. But we're going to uh, hopefully be fully open in early September. All schools should be open. We want our kids back in the classroom. Thanks, Patrick. Um, over to Megan from WMTW. Hi, good afternoon. Thank you for taking my question. Um, so I've heard a lot of people talk just, you know, um, you know, overhearing people speaking about the pandemic in the past tense, like when we were in a pan pandemic and um, as if it's it's over. And I just wanted to see where it, it obviously by today's announcement, it, it sounds like, you know, that that's clearly not the case. So I would be interested to see how you categorize where we stand right now. How would you describe it? And, um, you know, just your general thoughts, if you if you've also made that observation. There is no declaration as there is when you finish a battle or finish a war. Um, there's no peace treaty signed. There is a progress, great progress being made by our state in particular that we're very proud of. There are still people in the hospital. There are still people in, in ICUs. There are still people getting sick. So the virus is still among us. The virus is there and some uh, variants appearing in other states and countries that we're concerned about. But and nobody's declaring the pandemic over. Declaration of a state of emergency is a different, a little different thing, expanding on that. And that's what we are um, hoping to end in the next two weeks. Thanks, Megan. Uh, let me turn now to Charlie from Maine Public. Thanks, uh, Dr. Shaw and Commissioner Lambrew and Governor Mills. Um, I just have one question and it's for the governor. I, I know the uh, back to work program you just announced, it's very young, but do you have any early sense of how many people just in this, I guess since yesterday have, have already <laughs> tried to, to join that or take advantage of that? I don't, honestly, it's a little early. Um, we're just announcing it and we're doing a lot of other things too, to encourage people who are receiving unemployment, for instance, to go back to work at least substantially part-time and keep the, keep the $300 stipend. You don't, uh, you don't hear about that too much, but it's a real advantage. It's a win-win uh, that people could retain that $300 stipend through September 4th, but also earn a lot more money, be working and supporting their families and make more money than on unemployment. So that's what we're promoting. And we're promoting the work search requirement, which is tightened. You know, if people, if uh, someone's on unemployment, receiving unemployment benefits, and they are offered a job that they're qualified for, and they don't uh, take the job, that can be reported to the Department of Labor, and a person may uh, may lose their benefits. And thirdly, the back to work uh, stipend program we announced just this week. It's too early to see how many people are taking advantage of it, but I think employers will get the word out. You, you drive around the state of Maine, you see signs saying help wanted, got a pulse, got a job here, <laughs> things of that sort. I think there'll be signs out saying come work for us and get a $1,500 bonus too. Um, so those things are happening. So early to tell, but I think it will, will be successful. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Charlie. And over to Rachel Ohm next. Hi, thank you. Um, so I have two questions. My first question, Dr. Shaw, is for you. And I was wondering if you could um, 
can kind of say generally who who are the people that we're still seeing dying from the virus? Like, do you know if a lot of them have underlying conditions or or have they been vaccinated? Just just who are the people that we're still seeing get really sick and die? Sure, Rachel. Um, the, the way that reports come into us, uh, after we receive a death report, we then verify it and do a little bit more diligence. We don't report, we don't wait or delay reporting publicly on those deaths, but it takes us a little bit more time to get the full epidemiological picture. So I just want to say that as a, as a, you know, just an overarching note, but here's what we know about deaths since around March. Uh, they have, they have trended younger. Uh, they have often had underlying conditions, but that's been a constant throughout. Um, and increasingly we are finding as we go back and do that epidemiological analysis, they are unvaccinated. We have better data, uh, less so on deaths, but more so on those who have been hospitalized lately. And there the data are a bit more complete. And we found both of those things to hold true with hospitalizations. Namely, that who is being hospitalized in Maine has now shifted toward younger individuals. Previously, the average age of hospitalizations were among folks in their 60s. Now it's among folks in their mid 40s. They have generally been from rural areas as opposed to being from more urban areas. And about 80% or so, that number changes every week because of who's being hospitalized. But roughly in Maine and nationwide, about 80 to 90% of folks who are in the hospital being treated for COVID are unvaccinated. Again, that's both a national figure as well as the main figure. Okay, thank you. Um, and my other my other question is: um, Are there any groups that you're aware of that were that were having trouble reaching in terms of vaccines? Like, are there any concerns with accessibility anywhere? Hmm. Accessibility. God, we've been all over the state, and the mobile vaccination unit right now is in Old Orchard Beach, at Old Orchard Beach, and um, uh, we hope that they will have, they will may have uh, reached ten thousand people in the state of Maine before they're through. Um, so, and that that unit itself has been everywhere from um, Oxford County up to uh, Rooster County up to over to Washington County, um, all over the state. And private practitioners now have some access to vaccines. Pharmacies all over the state have access. So in terms of physical access, and we have vaccinated homebound people. And you know, the Medicare, the federal government has just upped the um, reimbursement for Medicare for um, people getting vaccinated. So I, I can't think of what else we could do right this minute to provide more physical access uh, to people. In terms of who's not getting vaccinated, it's hard for me to tell. Uh, I don't dare say or categorize any any people, but we know that, as Dr. Shaw just said, the people who are in the hospital who are very, very sick with COVID, by and large, are those who have not gotten vaccinated. And so while people may think they can take a chance now because our statistics are pretty good, we brag this Maine is a safe state, it's still not safe if you haven't been vaccinated. Okay, so so that would be no. You're not worried about anyone that is having trouble getting the vaccine anymore. If somebody ha is having trouble getting to a place where they can get vaccine, they should let us know. We will find a place. We have an eight 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 number, uh, which which can be which they can call to find a place near them. We'll not just find them a place. We'll give them a ride there. We'll yes. help them. You know, we'll we'll help them with every element uh, of getting vaccinated that that they need. In general, I think you know, our strategy has shifted away, somewhat away from the larger scale sites, although some are still open to be sure, now toward moving vaccine to people where they are. Okay, all right, I think I'm all set, thank you. Thanks, thank Rachel. You. Uh, let me go to Brian Sullivan next. Thank you, Dr. Shaw. Uh, my first question is for Governor Mills. Uh, Governor, any consideration to doing away with that federal unemployment assistance before the sep current September uh, deadline? Frankly, no, Brian. I don't think that's going to be a successful tactic, tactic in other states either, but it's become a partisan issue, which is unfortunate. We're doing a number of things to get people back into the workforce. One of the big barriers 
especially for women who were who were in low wage jobs before the pandemic and who lost those jobs because of the pandemic. One of the big barriers is childcare still. So we're waiting for the legislature to work to act on our, our main jobs and recovery plan, which uses millions of dollars of federal money, purely federal money, no match required to beef up childcare programs, beef up training programs at the um, at the university and community colleges to train early childhood teachers and child care workers uh, and and provide stipends to those individuals who are taking care of other people's children to let those parents get back into the workforce. That's one of the big barriers that we're hearing about. Uh, and then the other measures that I've already mentioned, I think are more realistic um, uh, and more, pro I think more productive, will be more productive in getting people back to work. Uh, and I'll stick with you, Governor. Uh, the incentivizing program that you've recently launched to get people back to work. Any thought uh, or is there money available to extend that beyond uh, the eight weeks? You know, tourism still a couple of months, uh, leaf peeping season into, you know, October and November um, to maybe try and get people after that eight weeks is up to, to stay working. We don't expect people to drop their jobs after eight weeks, not at all. We expect people to stay employed. And, and um, quite frankly, they can't just leave their job and, and then claim unemployment benefits. That wouldn't, that wouldn't work. Legally, it wouldn't work. So we expect people to stay employed, to, to work well, and to help support their families. And remember that $300 disappears early September, just as school starting. And and people are going to need to be working well before that time back in the workforce. This isn't just about summertime jobs. This is about uh, boosting the economy overall, getting back to work, um, allowing businesses to thrive, allowing families to thrive on something more than unemployment and state benefits uh, and being productive members of society. Thank you. And I guess for all of you real quickly, just what put us over the top to decide that this, the the system that we just talked about, the what, 876,000 right now, and hopefully a, a bunch more, what was what put us over the top to think this is the way to go? Well, we've been discussing this for a couple of weeks now, some kind of additional incentive program. Uh, and I, I just think we landed on this after talking with a lot of experts in the area. Uh, what are the best incentives? And we decided, unlike some other states, we decided to pin the number at the number of people vaccinated. I think that's unique. The number of people vaccinated, so it's a it's a double incentive. Go back, go get vaccinated at least one shot before June third, the end of June thirtieth, end of the day, and pump up the numbers. So whoever wins that pot, wins that money, will win a bigger amount. And you have a better chance of getting uh, of, of winning that money if you get vaccinated now. And it, but it includes everybody. Um, this is one of the things we heard about in the last incentive, last round of incentives, that people who had already been vaccinated weren't getting the benefit, uh, and people will have the benefit now with, with this sweepstakes program. Everyone who's been vaccinated since December fifteenth. Thank you. Thanks, Brian. Uh, over to Amy Brown next. Thank you, Dr. Shaw, Governor Mills, Commissioner Lambrew. I think probably my first question is for uh, maybe Commissioner Lambrew. There's a hotel in Bangor that was used for housing unhoused people uh, during the pandemic, and I assume there are probably others in other parts of the state. Uh, that's the only one I'm aware of, but I'm just wondering what's happening with that or those facilities, if they're being phased out and uh, if you could evaluate how successful you think that program is in, in terms of where people are going after, if there have been people in there to help them get matched with permanent housing. Just a general comment on that whole program. Sure. We are so proud of our partnership with Maine State Housing Authority, our municipalities, the city of Bangor, the city of Portland, as well as some of the smaller towns and cities that did work with us during the pandemic to make sure that when individuals who are unhoused don't have an option for being in isolation or quarantine, depending on their circumstances, could do so safely. That was a program that does continue to this day. We do still have, you know, as, as Director Shaw mentioned, another 50 cases today, 
we still have a need to support people who don't have the option of that kind of isolation or quarantine having safe places. We do have federal funding that is ongoing to provide that support, but equally important, providing that kind of casework or case management, providing them connections with some of the new programs that are also coming out of Washington. There's significant support in the American Rescue Plan for temporary rental assistance, for example, for our municipalities to begin to build better systems for affordable housing. So we are working hand in glove with our partners at Maysite Housing Authority to not just help during the pandemic to care for people who otherwise would struggle to maintain the public health protocols, but put them on a pathway towards more permanent housing as we recover. Great. So what I'm hearing you say then is that there's not going to be a sudden like, all right, you're out by this date and everybody that it's being phased out slowly with a look toward getting people into permanent housing. Absolutely. And I would say, you know, Governor Mills, when she announced the end of the state of civil emergency, did say we have time until June 30th to figure out if there's a transition need for needed for any programs. And we're working on that just to make sure that there's a smooth transition as we move through the end of the pandemic, which is, as Dr. Shaw said earlier, not yet over. All right. Thank and you. I'll say that we, we proposed $50 million of the federal <clears throat> American Relief Plan, American Rescue Plan money uh, through our proposal to the Appropriations Committee, $50 million for housing, expanding affordable housing for workers and their families across the state of Maine. Plus, uh, Maine Housing has separate uh, funds. Uh, they received a total of $200 million early on in this year that they're spending down for rent, rental relief as well. Great, thank you. And uh, Dr. Shah, I'm going to ask you to kind of look into your crystal ball here. Uh, some experts are predicting that the upcoming flu season may be more severe than usual. Uh, do you have any thoughts about that and how that might, whether things will be easier to deal with if we do have a bad flu season this year because of the availability of COVID testing to quickly rule out that it's COVID mm. or, you know, how that will work? We're unmasked now, we're in public together. What's that going to look like? Sure, Amy. You know, the reason that some um, virologists and infectious disease experts are starting to grow concerned about the upcoming cold and flu season is because this past cold and flu season was so mild, owing in part to the widespread masking and physical distancing. And thus, the immunity that we sometimes keep with us from year to year may have waned a bit as we go into the fall. That's the concern, at least. Of course, only time will tell whether this year's flu season is in fact worse than prior years or whether it's on par. But we go into the flu season with a couple of things in our favor. The first is just much greater awareness of respiratory diseases. Uh, things like the flu and obviously COVID are top of mind for everybody. We also, I think, will go into the flu season, I hope, with an ethos we've developed, which is if you're sick, stay home. That's a good thing to do not a heroic thing to do, it's the thing you should be doing. Uh, in fact, the unheroic thing is to show up for work if you're not feeling well. Things of that nature will normalize good public health practices, hopefully keep a lid on things. And then of course, we've already got much of the public health infrastructure in place. Testing, hospital capacity, things of that nature will already be with us so that if this year's flu season is worse, we'll be really prepared for it. Finally, it's not too early to start thinking about and reminding everybody that in addition to the COVID shot you just got, you probably will, you will, you will definitely need a flu shot this year. Usually flu shots come out in September, but we really ramp up recommendations around them in October. That's going to be a way to stay healthy this winter. Thank you. Thanks, Amy. Uh, next, over to Chris Costa. Hi, everybody. Uh, I just wanted to kind of follow up on, on Brian Sullivan's question about the sweepstakes. Um, and if you could kind of talk a little bit more about the genesis for it. Was was there a reason for uh, wanting to do this now? Was it a fact, maybe a, a lack of demand to try to spur more people to get a shot? <clears throat> I, we're competitive. We're a competitive group here. You know, We want to be first in the nation. We don't want to be second or third. We want to beat out Vermont. We want to beat out Connecticut. And um, so, so, so New England's sibling rivalry. 
we're not satisfied. We're, we're pleased with our product progress, but we're never satisfied until we're number one. And I think President Biden laid down the gauntlet when he said, all st- we want to have all states get at least 50, 70% of all adults by July 4th. We thought, July 4th, that's a good theme. Independence Day, what can we do? And then we brainstormed a bit about what we can do and where we can find some federal money that is al- allowable and, and, and usable for this kind of purpose. And, I know people like to play the lottery. I've seen the figures. I've seen the budget for the lottery and the sweepstakes are very, very popular. So we thought, let's do a sweepstake and let's include everybody who's gotten a shot, at least one shot, back to December. We don't want to discriminate. We want to leave. We don't want to leave those people out. They were good players early on and did what they're supposed to do. So let's reward them too with a potential prize. Sounds good. And then uh, my second question for anybody who's... Uh feeling up to answering it. We've spoken <laughs> with some uh, hospital officials in, uh, I guess, what's become my favorite county, which is Somerset County. Um, unfortunately, they're, they're feeling a little bit discouraged about the recent and what they're kind of telling me is a drastic drop in demand for the vaccine. And I guess for Dr. Shaw and Commissioner Lambrews, more, more specifically, you know, are you guys seeing that? And, and what does that mean for Somerset County? Yep. Chris, I'll, I'll start. Uh, Commissioner, um, we, we have seen we, we've seen a reduction in, in demand across the state. Uh, that's, of course, one reason behind today's announcement, to be sure, as the governor noted. Um, but you're right, Chris, Somerset County, as well as a couple of others, Oxford, Piscataquis, um, there's we're hoping that we can use programs and incentives of this nature to spur demand. It's as simple as that. <clears throat> we're not constrained excuse me, by the supply of vaccine any longer. So there's vaccine out there. If this is what it takes to get folks to nudge them to come in, then all the better. And we've been working with the main broadcasters and others to do a lot more public relations uh, along these lines, a lot of more public service ads and and paid advertising um, to reach out to various groups, various sectors of the population uh, who might not think it's any longer necessary to get a vaccine, who might be thinking, well, I can let down my guard. So many other people are getting vaccinated, why me? And of course, the why me is the 32 people who are in the hospital today, uh, 17 of them in ICU, which nobody wants to have happen. But we're getting the messaging out, making this hopefully part of a a routine uh, of every family to get vaccinated, uh, particularly against COVID-19. Commissioner, was there something you were going to add? Okay, if, if, you, if you don't mind, then just a, a very brief follow up, just because you mentioned it, Dr. Shaw. Are there other counties that you're seeing a similar trend in the drop off for demand or I guess even by contrast, the examples of counties where you're seeing a lot of the, or you're feeling optimistic about the trends? <clears throat> um, oh, Chris, you know, the, the one area in which so what, what has been driving new uptake in demand for vaccine lately has been kids in the 12 to 15 or 12 to 18 category. And so counties with more younger kids have seen either a a change in their curve or at a minimum, a slowing in the decline of demand. Um, And so not surprisingly, the opposite is true. Counties with fewer young people have seen an accelerated decline. Again, incentives like this may be the thing that helps turn that around, though. Thank you all. Thanks, Chris. And the last question for the afternoon goes to David from the BDN. Thanks, Dr. Shaw. Uh, vaccination rates in the rural communities surrounding Bangor are significantly lower than in their urban counterparts, sometimes 30% lower. Um, is rural vaccine hesitancy a top concern for the CDC and state generally? And what do you believe can be done to encourage people in these communities to get the shot? Provide a sweepstakes, sweepstakes prize. Who knows? It could be you, Dave. <laughs> or, you know, encouraging families to to bring other family members in and their neighbors and friends, um, bring in other families and, and friends to get vaccinated. Just to make it the thing to do. Um, the more people are vaccinated, the more free they feel, the more safe they feel, the more safe they are. And I think that's an important feeling, an important um change in our culture from the last from a year ago Uh, and we can only keep doing that we can only do that as individuals if we're vaccinated if you're not vaccinated you may well catch COVID-19 virus you may well catch a variant very strange and more highly transmissible and dangerous variant of the 
of the virus too. Very, very dangerous. So just because you live in a rural area or, you know, a lot of Maine is rural, uh, a lot of people in counties across the state have been have been sick, have been sickened and have been hospitalized and have had uh, ventilators uh, and have, have, have had ventilators and have been in ICU and nobody wants that to happen. It can still happen. We had people in my county, Franklin County, very, very sick just the last, last week or two. And I don't want to see my friends and family get sick. So we talk it up, <coughs> encourage it, uh, tell people how beneficial it is. I think word is getting out, maybe getting out a little slower in some areas than others. People think when we're outdoors, what could you, what could possibly happen that's bad? We're out fishing or hiking, kayaking, canoeing, boating, and you feel safer. But you still, if you haven't been vaccinated, you're never really safe. Dave, to follow on that, um, there are there are data that suggest that for that group of people, uh, the one message and one messenger that will potentially change minds is their doctor. Um, and one of the things that we've been doing throughout the larger scale vaccination effort is to work with primary care doctors in Maine to have them be the trusted voice in communities. Again, to be the one, the messenger, as well as to carry a message saying that vaccines are safe, effective, and the good thing to do. Not long ago, the American Medical Association came up with survey data showing that about 96% of America's doctors, when offered the vaccine, took it. And so the message there, I think, is clear. If you trust your doctor to help guide you in every other area of your healthcare life, then why not do the same when it comes to COVID? Um, just a quick, oh, uh, yeah. just, a, just a quick follow up. I mean, do you worry about the rural, uh, Doctor Shad? Do you worry about you know the rural hesitancy if it was to continue that it could uh, affect her immunity efforts? Um, you know, so I, I worry about it insofar as it provides an opening for the virus to keep running, um, and, and to the extent that that could affect overall case trends in Maine and potentially lead to outbreaks in places like long term care facilities it's definitely a risk. Um, that being said, Dave, and, and again, I fully acknowledge it's a risk. It is probably from a vaccine communications perspective, our top priority. That being said, we are blessed that even in the less vaccinated counties in Maine, their vaccination rates are still above that which we've seen in other parts of the country. Yet another example of other states still trying to catch up to where Maine is right now, but make no mistake, Dave, you're absolutely right. That is a concern uh, as, as we think about vulnerable populations in particular. The more we can do to tamp down on community transmission in some of the counties you mentioned, the safer that everyone in those counties will be, particularly the most vulnerable. And there are many children who are not yet eligible for vaccine. So they are vulnerable and susceptible to the virus. If you're not vaccinated and you can carry that virus to other people who aren't even eligible for the vaccine. You got to think about that responsibility and that danger too. Thanks, Dave. Um, Governor, I'm going to turn things back over to you in just a second, but we've got some updates oh. uh, on the on the uh, the sweepstakes thus far. Uh, oh. Commissioner Wambrew, can I turn that over to you? <laughs> We're very excited that as of 2.34, we have 1,065 people who have already registered for that sweepstake. As a reminder, you can go to maine.gov backslash COVID-19 backslash vaccines and find the link to register. It takes about less than a minute to sign up. We will be doing this drawing on June 30th. And if you don't have access to the internet, just remember, you can always call 1-888-445-4111. That'll turn it over to Governor Mills. That's one 445 4111 and or main.gov backslash COVID-19 backslash vaccines. I, I hope you all have a great day and uh, rest of the week. And um, please, if you haven't gotten vaccinated, seriously, talk to your doctor. Or just go see your pharmacist. Get vaccinated. Really, there's just no downside to it. No downside. Help us make one Maine number one in the country again. We're very close. And put your name in for a pretty big prize. Thank you all for listening. Thank you, everyone.